Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. For every crime that's committed, you've got three million suspects to choose from. Most of the time, you'll have few facts and a lot of hunches. There is a killer walking around out there. There's a vicious killer out there. As a detective, I'm looking for clues. There's a guy out here watching my house. The real fear is that he's done this again. I don't know. But this is an evil, evil person. The reason it's difficult to talk logically about the intruder theory is that it's usually presented as more of a defense case than an actual theory. The Ramses have identified reasonable doubt everywhere they possibly can, picking out countless details that could be suspicious. Furthermore, without a suspect, it's very hard to talk about a motive or a sequence of events. There are several obvious illogicalities in the theory. Why would a kidnapper write the ransom note in the house, rather than bringing one with him? Why would you go to all this trouble for a kidnapping and then leave the body in the house? Why cover up the initial motive with a second, totally different motive? There's no real way to talk about the intruder theory without simply shutting out these questions and just pretending they don't exist. So let's get started. The body of evidence used to support the intruder theory is enshrined in a civil case from 2003, Wolf v. Ramsey, also known as the Carnes case after the name of the judge, Julie Carnes. That case has provided the apparent factual basis for many defamation claims made by the Ramseys over the years, although those so-called facts are far from impartial. The plaintiff, a man named Chris Wolfe, sued the Ramseys for calling him a suspect in their book, The Death of Innocence. Unfortunately, Mr. Wolfe made no attempt to dispute the Ramseys' portrayal of the facts of the crime, so the Ramseys' lawyers were free to define the evidence as they saw fit. They proceeded to repeat several of Lou Smith's unproven theories as though they were facts. Judge Carnes herself stated this very clearly a few years later. My decision was based only on the civil record before me, which did not include the police investigative reports. The plaintiff, Chris Wolf, had made little to no effort to adduce any facts in support of his contentions, and my order did not profess to answer definitively the question of who had murdered the child. Mike Kane confirmed that many of the so-called unexplained or suspicious details presented as intruder evidence in that case had already been resolved years earlier. They were clearly in the police file answers to a lot of the things that the court said had never been uh, established. Unfortunately, commentators on the Ramsey case, often with good intentions of promoting fairness or balance, are sucked in by the apparently authoritative nature of the Carnes case. It's one of the main reasons why every fact in this case now has its own alternative fact that makes the Ramseys look good. Rather than enumerating every piece of possible evidence that may or may not support different variants of the intruder theory, I'll try to provide an overview of its basic claims. In order to understand the gist of this theory, it's important to know about the background of Lou Smith who was really the architect of the theory. Well, Lou Smith was a legendary detective. Smith saw himself as an old-fashioned detective. His past cases included abductions, spree killings, and kidnappings. His claim to fame before the Ramsey case was a lucky break that led him to solve the murder of Heather Dawn Church in 1995. Heather had been abducted from her home and her body was found 30 miles away. Although her parents were completely cooperative, some people suspected her father, and the case had been unsolved for three years when Lou Smith was called in. As the Denver Post described it, he reorganized the case and labeled it a burglary gone bad. Smith looked at the crime scene photographs and decided to take a wild gamble by retesting a fingerprint found on a window screen. Lo and behold, it led them to the killer, a crazed pedophile. In the Heather Dawn Church case, there was an intruder. At first, the parents were blamed for that crime, too. Smith was still riding high on the success of this intruder case when DA Alex Hunter hired him to reinvestigate the Ramsey case. 
Smith has often claimed falsely that he was undecided or even suspicious of the Ramseys before signing on to the case, but the records make it very clear Smith was always convinced of the Ramseys' innocence. He said himself his very first assumption about the case was that the note was not written after the crime, as he recounted to the Rocky Mountain News, I told Alex, look, I don't know if you're going to hire me, but I'll give you a freebie. Whoever wrote this note did not do it after the murder. This rules out the possibility of staging, and thus rules out the Ramses. This was a very controlled, planned, sophisticated ransom note. To sit down and write a note like that, with all of those details in there, after you brutally killed your daughter, come on, give me a break. It's no wonder Alex Hunter decided to hire him. Clearly, Smith wanted to work his magic a second time. He didn't want Jean Benet's death to be a domestic abuse case. He wanted it to be a real kidnapping, just like Heather Dawn Church. With this background in mind, let's look at Smith's theory. The essence of Smith's profile, such as it is, is that the killer was an evil psychopath. The Ramses and their supporters have referred to the intruder as a deranged subhuman who simply doesn't follow the laws of logic. This person is a madman. It's a monster. They're, they don't think logically. This person is a monster. It's a subhuman. This person doesn't think like you and I do. This person is not going to make sense. None of it makes sense. You're right. It None was an it. evil, What was the guy doing? Evil, why, did the, why did the intruder do this? Man. Evil, evil I don't know, person. but when we find out, and God we will willing, we will know. Find this creature. To quote one of the Ramsey's supporters in the Boulder Police Force, Robert Whitson, People say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Nobody in their normal mind would do that. Keep in mind, you're not dealing with a normal person. You're dealing with a psychopathic personality. FBI profiler Greg McCrary disputed this. He says the language of the ransom note does not point to this type of offender. The writer's articulate, well-spoken, there's good sentence structure, grammar, syntax, all that uh, vocabulary all indicates a, a well-educated offender. This is not anyone crazy or irrational or mentally disordered. Occasionally, John has discussed a slightly more coherent motive for the killer. John Douglas, who is a very noted uh, FBI crime profiler, said he believed that it was someone who was angry at me or jealous of me, mm -hmm. and it was primarily directed at me. And that was hard for me to accept and to, to swallow. But she was sexually assaulted, the child. Yes. So maybe the motivation was to, it, was a pedophile's motivation. Well, that there is that it theory as well. Yeah. The Ramses have never offered an explicit explanation for how the killer could simultaneously be motivated by revenge on Jean Ramsey and pedophilia. And they seem to advocate either one of these motives at different times. On the one hand, Lou Smith seems to believe firmly that the motive was primarily sexual. I'm looking for a pedophile that's a sexual sadist. That's what Lou Smith's looking for. And on the revenge side, the Ramses generally point to that one quote from John Douglas. John Douglas, who's a very well-known crime profiler. John Douglas, who's a, a very brilliant man. Just to be clear, Douglas worked for the Ramses. He was paid by the Ramsey defense team. And the only so-called evidence he saw was what the defense team decided to show him. I just don't believe in my heart he did this, and not just in my heart, from, what, from the analysis of the, of the scene. But you're being paid by the Ramsey family. Right. He never saw the case file, and he was heavily criticized by his FBI colleagues for his work on this case. It's also interesting to note that while Douglas clearly believed John Ramsey was innocent, he didn't seem to have the same confidence about Patsy. As he stated on April 14th, 1998, It's just a short leap to imagine Patsy getting out of control for one moment and doing something terrible to that sweet little girl. But to return to the theory, now that we have a faint suggestion of a motive in mind, we can attempt to put together a sequence of events. The theory generally goes that the killer entered the house while the Ramses were out. This person was watching the house that day, and when we left in the afternoon, he came in. They certainly could have been in the house for uh, four or five hours while we were gone. I think they came into the house after we left, were there when we came home, waited till we fell asleep. The next logical question then is, how did the intruder get in? There was a broken window in the basement. John admits he broke the window himself a few months before the crime. When John went downstairs on the 26th, he claims he found that window open. 
Initially, he said it was open about an eighth of an inch, but over time, this changed into John claiming it was, quote, wide open. There was a suitcase in the basement, which Lou Smith says the killer stood on when leaving through the window. It's important to note that window could not be seen from outside the house. It opened onto a window well, which was below ground level and covered by a heavy steel grate. Nevertheless, Lou Smith formulated a theory in which the killer somehow knew that window was there and that it was broken. On Christmas night, Smith says, the killer lifted up that grate, climbed down into the window well, reached through the broken window, unlatched it from the inside, opened it, and then slid through the window into the basement. There's one big problem here. On day one, police observed cobwebs, proving the grate could not have been opened that night. Both Sergeant Tom Wickman and Detective Mike Everett had seen at least three strands of a spider web reaching from the brick window well upward to the covering grate. There were also cobwebs in the corner of the window frame itself. To enter or exit through that window without disturbing any of those four spider webs would be impossible. So if he didn't use the window, maybe he came in through a door somehow. John told Officer French the house was locked up. Although, of course, this story later changed. The Ramses also told police on day one that the only people who had keys to the house were a few relatives and the housekeeper. Over time, the list of people with keys grew larger and larger. The reasons to doubt this are obvious, but let's say, for the sake of argument, that this intruder somehow gained access to the house that afternoon without being seen by neighbors without alerting the neighbor's dog that normally barked whenever somebody walked past, and most impressively, without leaving a single trace. Once inside, he found Patsy's notepad and pen and proceeded to write that ransom note. Remember, the Ramses could have come home at any point. Every second an intruder spent in that house was a risk, not just of being discovered, but of leaving traces of himself. But this intruder was apparently extremely fortunate. In fact, luck seemed to work exclusively in his favor. So according to the theory, the killer spent his time in the home describing in precise detail a kidnapping that never happened. Mr. Ramsey, listen carefully. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. We were supposed to draw $118,000 from your account. $100,000 will be in $100 bills. When you get home, you will put the money in a brown delivery bag. It will be exhausting, so I advise you to be rested. If we monitor you getting the money early, we might call you early to arrange an earlier delivery of the money. Watching over your daughter do not particularly like you. To alert bank authorities, she dies. If the money is in any way marked or tampered, try to grow a brain, John. You are not the only fat cat around. It's up to you now, John. Victory. SBTC. The intruder theory offers little in the way of explanation when it comes to this note. Obviously, the person who wrote it knew the family. And it was premeditated. This person knew of us, may not have been a close acquaintance, but knew about us, knew about John's business, you know, knew that we had children. The number 118 had significance to this person. SBTC meant something to this killer. Uh, we're not looking for a needle in a haystack. Lou Smith says this person was an expert on movies. It's like a PhD in ransom notes that was gained through watching movies. Another key component of the intruder theory concerns the alleged use of a stun gun on Jean Benet. Although stun guns are loud weapons that usually cause victims to scream and run away, Smith believed the two small abrasions on Jean Benet's lower back resembled the marks that are made by stun guns. I think that the stun gun is one of the best clues left behind by the killer, as far as a clue. Although he never actually found a model of stun gun that lined up with the marks, he was adamant in his claim that one was used. But again, Smith's theory contradicts the physical evidence. The fact is, stun guns create burns not abrasions. This is well established in a long history of medical and legal cases. The marks on Jean Benet's back are identified in the autopsy as abrasions. Prosecutor Mike Kane pointed this out. The thing about the, the stun gun that everybody keeps coming back to, there was one person, one person who was qualified 
who actually looked at that little girl's body on the autopsy table, and that was Dr. Myers, who's a forensic pathologist. He looked at those very marks and said that they were abrasions. It, it is a quantum leap. You can take you can take a stun gun and put it up against somebody's body, and yeah. it's going to leave a burn. It does not leave an abrasion. So all these these other opinions that have come out that said that this was a stun gun, there is absolutely no way they would ever get into evidence because there is no evidence that these were burns. As stun gun expert Dr. Robert Stratbucker said under oath when shown the images of the marks on Jean Benet's body, This is an abrasion. I know it is not a stun gun. In spite of this, Lou Smith and the Ramses kept on insisting that the coroner got it wrong and that these marks were stun gun burns, even hiring somebody called Dr. Michael Doberson, who had no expertise in the area and who had never examined Jean Benet's body, who claimed that Smith's theory was plausible. If they really wanted to prove the coroner wrong and dispute those findings, the only way to do that would be to exhume the body and examine those marks directly. And in fact, to their credit, Lou Smith and his team actually did want to do this. But the Ramses refused. I wasn't convinced that it was conclusively going to help. They have photographs. They have they have, experts they have, have said, enough that they very, that they know. Very compelling. Another essential part of Lou Smith's intruder theory concerns the garrote. Smith often claims, without any evidence, that the garrote was a sophisticated, professional device. A garrote used for strangling. This was a professional tool. This wasn't an amateur device. The photographs of Jean Benet's neck show small, petechial hemorrhages, which are a consequence of strangulation. The autopsy specifically identifies these as petechial hemorrhages. But Lou Smith believed, again with no basis other than his gut instinct, that these were fingernail marks. The most significant part of this particular photograph is that there's half-moon abrasions directly above the ligature. These most likely are fingernail marks where John Bonet was trying to get the garrote from her neck. She tried to save her own life. And whoever did that to John Bonet had to see her doing this. This is a very brutal killing. To be clear, Lou Smith was a policeman. He had no medical training whatsoever. Smith insisted that the neck cord was part of some perverted sexual torture. This is a sexual device. Then this noose was pulled very tightly against the neck of John Bonet, almost like a control device, almost like you were controlling a pet or a dog. When that cord was put on the neck, Lou Smith repeatedly tells us, Jean Bonet was apparently awake and struggling. He was controlling her and she was trying to get it off of her neck. If you remember the sequence of injuries we talked about back in episode 3, you'll see that Lou Smith's sequence is completely out of order. In fact, this is his most drastic disagreement with the medical consensus in this case. Some of the nation's leading experts were consulted on those injuries. They agreed unanimously that the head blow happened 45 minutes to 2 hours before the strangulation. So Jean Benet was unconscious when that cord was applied. This was based on the extensive hemorrhaging, the swelling of the brain, and the necrosis of the tissues. But this doesn't work with Smith's theory. He instead claims that Jean Benet was gradually and sadistically strangled into unconsciousness. And then the killer decided to strike her on the head. In the case of Jean Benet, there was no swelling. Swelling of the brain suggested that Jean Benet had survived for some period of time. There was no bleeding. There is found to be an extensive area of scalp hemorrhage along the right temporoparietal area. If John Bonet was hit on the head first, that would have taken all that time to do this. There would have been massive bleeding inside that skull. So it's ludicrous even to think that the head blow came first. Once again, Smith is completely at odds with the medical consensus in this case. But this has not stopped John Ramsey from repeating Smith's theory as fact. The last act that this creature did to our daughter was a vicious blow to the head. That is irrefutable. And as he says just a few minutes later in the same interview. Most importantly though is the sequence of events. The last act this creature did to my beautiful child is strike her in the head with a vicious blow. She was either dead or near dead when that blow was administered. By now I think we're starting to see a pattern here. In all these areas where Lou Smith is disputing the evidence, he's trying to make the crime seem more brutal 
than the evidence suggests. The fingernail marks, the stun gun, the sexual bondage, the slow strangulation, the delaying of the head blow until the very end. It's as though the actual facts are not evil enough. For some reason, Smith feels the need to make it more evil. Indeed, if you watch enough interviews with Lou Smith, you begin to see he's not really trying to make sense of the crime at all. He's just emphasizing its brutality over and over again. Why he did all these things, I don't know. But John Bonet died a very brutal death. It's easy for us to overlook words like brutal or vicious, because of course we assume that by definition, any homicide of a child is brutal. But listen to how much Smith and the Ramsey defense team emphasize it. That is a very brutal, vicious personality that killed John Bonet. This is a massive, brutal head wound. This is brutal first degree murder. It's vicious and brutal. But that shows a very brutal death. Notice how bright red that is. The person who did this wanted to brutally kill John Bonet. Somebody brutally bludgeon John Bonet that night. This murder was not conducted upstairs in a nice little bedroom. This murder was conducted in the basement, and it was very vicious. This is a very brutal killing. Nothing in a family background would indicate to me that they're this brutal of people at all. Let's be honest. What Smith is advocating here is not a theory at all. It's an emotion, a feeling. There's this underlying belief that because the murder of a child is horrifying, the killer must be fundamentally evil. A person doesn't go throughout their lives as a normal human being, one night turn into a monster. That doesn't happen. The fact is, however, crimes are not committed by monsters or bogeymen. Crimes, even terrible ones, are committed by human beings. As FBI profiler Greg McCrary said, the district attorneys believe that the Ramses couldn't have done it because they're good Christians, they're nice people, and so forth. This is the wrong way to go about an investigation. This is a, a trap that people fall into sometimes. We want child killer, especially child killers, a heinous crime, to be different than you and I. We, we, and we're not comfortable when they are like us. We want them to uh, have a hunchback and drool one eye in the center of their forehead and drag a leg behind them when they walk and all that. The, the reality is, though, that, that murders and child murders are committed by people who are otherwise very nice people. And we just don't want that to be true, and it's an unsettling thing, and sometimes people have trouble getting over it. But that can't be what drives the investigation. The facts have to drive the investigation, and the theories have to emerge from the facts, not some preconception whether someone could do this or not do it. As a culture, we tend to externalize criminality. We demonize criminals. We lock them in jail. We keep them out of our neighborhoods and our suburbs. We watch movies about them. And we listen to true crime podcasts about them. We often refuse to believe that they could be complex people like us. All throughout this case, we see this idea come up. And it's not just Lou Smith and the DA's office. The idea is frequently supported in the media. Probably the most widely viewed interview with the Ramses was the Barbara Walters interview in 2000. Years later, when John Mark Carr was arrested for the crime after falsely confessing, Walters revealed she had never really thought the Ramses were the sort of people who would kill their child. Well, you know, you can't say publicly, you know, you or I or any journalist, you, you don't give your opinions. When I did that interview with them, I, you know, I hate to keep saying it was a gut, but they were such decent people. The love for the child was so apparent. I, I, I never felt that, that they were guilty. This gut instinct is one of the main reasons our society has trouble believing victims of abuse. In a way, the Ramses embody the white Christian suburban ideal, the successful CEO, the pageant-perfect housewife. They're the exact sort of people we're taught to respect, trust, and admire. Anyone, you know, from any walk of life can achieve the American dream. By calling this image into question, we're really questioning our own deeply held values, our own illusions. The desire for simple, reductive categories of good and evil seems to motivate a lot of supporters of the Ramses. Here's the Ramses lawyer, Lynn Wood, describing his own moral philosophy by way of the QAnon conspiracy theory. Some of these people that are involved in child sex trafficking, they're children of the devil. 
we have to realize that God created beings knowing that those beings were going to go to hell. He had to create children of the devil so that the children of God could love him and praise him for the difference in how their lives turned out. You can't know good unless you know bad. This is, of course, an extreme version of the idea, but the view that people have to be either intrinsically good or intrinsically evil is deeply ingrained in our society. And thanks to social media, this kind of superficial, binary thinking is not likely to go away anytime soon. 25 years on, it's impossible to say how many lives have been affected by this case. The list of people implicated by the Ramsey defense team is remarkably long. In fact, even now, because of the anniversary, I'm sure the Ramseys will be appearing on TV once again to drag more innocent people under the umbrella of suspicion. People like Jeff Merrick, Glenn Meyer, Joe Barnhill, Linda Hoffman, Chris Wolfe, Michael Helgoth. The Ramseys have been merciless in their willingness to throw people under the bus. None of these people were ever linked to the crime scene. None of them was ever found to have a coherent motive. A notable example is the White family, the ones who had Christmas dinner with the Ramseys hours before the killing. Unlike John and Patsy, the Whites cooperated fully with the police. They did everything they possibly could to help the investigation, even while John and Patsy were accusing them behind the scenes. But after Fleet White publicly questioned the impartiality of the DA's office, DA Alex Hunter personally engaged in a smear campaign against White himself, leaking a ridiculous conspiracy theory to the press. Fleet White's son, just seven years old at the time of the killing, is now a young man. Addressing the Boulder City Council, he described the impact this case has had on his life. I ask you to put yourself in my shoes. As a young adult starting my career, I have to live with Google search results that associate my name with the failed John Monet Ramsey murder investigation and the lies that Alex Hunter promoted in order to protect himself and John and Patsy Ramsey. Because we live uh, in the internet age, the lies and filth will follow us for the rest of our lives. To this day, Alex Hunter has never been held to account for his attempt to falsely implicate the whites in the crime, and people continue to speculate about many other so-called suspects without any factual basis. It's clear that John Ramsey has also been thinking a lot about his legacy. Just the other day, my nine-year-old granddaughter saw a tabloid in the supermarket, and it confused her. It hurt her. That's horrible. And that's, that's what I'm fighting. For her, I don't want her to, to wonder about her grandfather or be ashamed of me or our family name. Clearly, John is still very much invested in his own name and reputation. But in my view, there's something far more important at stake here, Jean Benet's legacy. What really matters, ultimately, is that we learn from this tragedy and use that knowledge to help give a voice to victims of abuse. Um, a doctor or a nurse to help people get well. A pediatrician. In the United States, five children die every day from abuse or neglect. We're slowly becoming more aware of abuse by powerful and respected people. We're beginning to see through the biases, the assumptions, the comforting lies we tell ourselves to avoid acknowledging reality. We've got a long way to go, but if our society can learn from Jean Benet's death, we'll be better at preventing similar tragedies in the future. <laughs>